please take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Our text today is Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. In recent weeks, we began studying the events of Yeshua's final week of ministry before his crucifixion. At this point in Matthew's story of the life and ministry of Yeshua, things are really beginning to heat up. After his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in chapter 21, he cleansed or cleared out the temple of the animal merchants and the money changers who were conducting business right there in the temple complex, turning it into a public marketplace. And on top of that, they were overcharging people who were there to offer sacrifices and pay the annual temple tax. This incident, along with his healing of the blind and the lame in the temple, caused the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem to be very unhappy with him. And so they came to him to try to discredit him. They came asking about the source of his authority to do all these things. It's like they were saying, hey, who do you think you are? Who gave you the uh, authority to do all this stuff? Who put you in charge? Who said you could do all this and cause all these disruptions? And how did Yeshua respond? Well, he answered their question with a question of his own about the source of the baptism or ministry of John the baptizer. Was it from God or from men? And that was a question that these leaders couldn't answer either way without making themselves look very bad to the general public because they had disregarded his words. And then Yeshua told three parables to show, for one thing, that what we do is much more important than what we say. But also, especially to show that the leadership of God's kingdom was being taken from those Jewish leaders of the first century. The scribes, the priests, the Sadducees, and especially the Pharisees whose teaching has evolved into the rabbinic Judaism of today. It was being taken away from all of them and given to the nation of people consisting of the remnant of Torah obedient believers in Yeshua also known in scripture as the Israel of God led initially by the apostles and then by the pastor and elders of each faith community as they are guided by the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit these three parables were a prophecy of judgment on these Jerusalem leaders because of their rejection of Yeshua and of their rejection of his authority. In the parable of the two sons, those leaders are like the son who said he would do the father's will, but he didn't, they didn't do it. And in the parable of the wicked husbandmen or tenant farmers, they're the wicked husbandmen who kill the prophets and even kill the householder's own son. And in the parable of the wedding feast, they are the condemned guests. And these Jewish leaders would have been well aware that Yeshua was speaking of them in those parables. They were no dummies. They knew what was going on. Well, this led to some confrontations between Yeshua and these leaders because they didn't want to lose their position of wealth and power and influence over the Jewish people. And this rebellious upstart, this Yeshua of Nazareth, was threatening their authority and threatening their control with his healing miracles and his teaching and his growing popularity. If ever there was a time when the Pharisees were open-minded about Yeshua, it has now clearly passed. So now they launch a counterattack as they begin to try to trap him by asking some carefully formulated questions, trying to get him to publicly say something wrong and discredit himself as the crowds watch and listen. Our text today begins right after Yeshua's third parable. Verse 15 says that, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. There's absolutely no question in the minds of the Jerusalem leaders now that 
the scribes and the priests and the Sadducees and especially some of the Pharisees are the primary target of Yeshua's parables. His stories were like public indictments against them as self-serving authorities. And so their move to try to find a way to do whatever it takes to silence him once and for all. This just couldn't go on. So they planned to lay a trap for him to get him to condemn himself by saying something in public that will get him in trouble. They send their disciples who teamed up with the supporters of King Herod to try to trip him up. That's, you might think that's kind of an unlikely collaboration. But sometimes a common enemy brings groups together. Verse 16 says, And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that you're true, and you teach the, word, the way of God in truth. Neither do you care for any man, for you regard not the person of men. Let's be sure we understand what's happening here. Here come some disciples of the Pharisees who studied with these Pharisees and followed their teaching. And they come to Yeshua along with some Jews who were supporters of Herod and therefore supporters of Rome too. That would be like Jewish people today being supporters of Iran or the Islamic State. None of these people would have been followers of Yeshua. They were all on the side of Yeshua's opposition. Although these disciples were probably less recognizable and less identifiable than the Pharisees who sent their disciples instead of coming themselves to make the trap harder to spot and to make it more effective. And there's a good chance that Yeshua wasn't as well acquainted with these guys. But do you think, just maybe, that Yeshua just might have figured out as soon as they started with all their flattery that they were up to no good? You think? I heard a good Bible teacher say that whenever someone begins a conversation with him by paying him several compliments, the red flags go up and he just automatically gets ready for something uncomfortable to follow because after the flattery, frequently there's a but and a point of disagreement or a difficult question and perhaps one that's framed in such a way to point out the very issue of disagreement. It would be like me going up to an insurance man and saying, Jerry, I know that you're honest and I know you believe in your product. I, I know. And I know that you're successful and you have this nice big office and lots of customers and surely you treat them all fairly and equally but I think Jerry would smell a problem coming as soon as I started talking <laughs> and I think Yeshua knew right away that these disciples and, and these Herodians were setting him up for something it wouldn't take any supernatural spiritual discernment to figure that out just wisdom and common sense and I guarantee you, Yeshua had plenty of both of those. And there's something ironic in these words of flattery that are spoken by these men. Even though they really didn't believe what they were saying to him about being true and teaching the true way of God, they didn't believe that, but it was true. What was lies to them were really true. We know that they didn't believe these things about Yeshua because if they did, they would have been following him as his disciples instead of setting up a trap. And besides that, Yeshua calls them wicked hypocrites in verse 18. Now in verse 16, the phrase, the way of God, is thought to refer to halakha. Halakha is a Hebrew word that means the path that one walks, the way to walk, the way to go, the way to live. 
In other words, it refers to our understanding of how we are to live out God's commandments in everyday life, including the precise details of how to obey them. In their, in their underhanded flattery of Yeshua, the Pharisees' disciples actually acknowledge that Yeshua is the true authority in Halakha. But even though he is that authority, they obviously didn't really want to believe or accept that. Now notice the last two phrases in verse 16. In the King James it says, Neither do you care for any man, for you regard not the person of men. A more literal translation of the Greek would be, You care for no one, for you do not look into the face of men. Now, Peter says in Acts 10, verse 34, that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, he shows no partiality to anyone. He treats us all fairly. To look into the face of someone, as this literally says, that's a figure of speech that describes the desire to please that person, to show regard or favor or care for that person. And it's similar to the Hebrew phrase, nasa panim, which means to lift up the face. And this phrase can have either a positive or a negative meaning. But the most common use is the one that we see in the priestly benediction or the Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 and following that we end our service with each week where Yahweh is asked to lift up his face or his countenance toward you or upon you and grant you peace, meaning to show you favor. The point that's being made here by the Pharisees' disciples here in this last part of verse 16 is that the question that they're about to ask Yeshua begins with the premise that he does not teach to please people, nor does he change his teaching to satisfy anyone or gain a following by compromising the truth. That's a good thing. I don't know about you, but I'm real glad that Yeshua is not a crowd pleaser. Amen. And once again, the statement being made by the Pharisees' disciples is true, it's accurate, it's right, it's correct, even though they didn't really think so. They seem to be hoping to be able to show that Yeshua just might bend his teaching with regard to Caesar and Rome. They're trying to set him up to fall into their trap. So they continue talking to him and they, they ask him a tricky little question. In verse 17 they say, tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Yeshua, what, what do you say? Should we pay this tribute, these, these taxes to Caesar or not? How would that line up with Torah, Yeshua? That's a good question. But their trap is obvious. If Yeshua says yes, he will lose the support of the masses who didn't want to pay this tax. He would alienate the majority of the Jewish people who thought of this tax as a sign of submission to Rome. Even though Jewish authorities helped to collect this tax, many, many Jews totally resented it and they considered it to be blasphemous. To them, acknowledging Caesar's rule over Israel by paying this tax was denigrating to Yahweh, belittling him, putting him beneath Rome. In a way, it was confessing Caesar to be their king in place of Yahweh or a descendant of David. But, you know, these Pharisees' disciples might have expected Yeshua to say, yes, it's lawful, because after all, he was a friend of the tax collectors, wasn't he? Didn't he say that about himself one time? 
Yeah. In Matthew eleven nine, he'd call himself a friend of the publicans. Publicans, that's the tax collectors or the customs officials. On the other hand, if Yeshua responds to their question with a, no, it's not lawful, he could be charged with the crime of sedition against Rome, resisting their authority and contributing to the disruption or the overthrow of Roman rule over Israel. You see, this question wasn't just about money and taxes. It was also about the Jewish public conscience and how this tax fit into their theology. There was already considerable unrest among the Jewish community over this kind of thing. And this, uh, this added to the, the danger and the potential effectiveness of this little trap. This is a perfect example of the need for wisdom and the need for applying wisdom to situation in our lives. We need to pray for wisdom. Especially before our conversations with unbelievers or with those who have been misled into believing false teaching. It's hard for us sometimes to know whether to speak out boldly or to hold our tongues and be more patient. But Yeshua always knew what to do. Yeshua was presented here with what these disciples of the Pharisees thought was a dilemma in which he would lose no matter how he answers. But we're going to see that he demonstrates insight and knowledge and how godly wisdom can face challenges that might otherwise seem impossible. Look at verse 18. Yeshua perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you tempt or test me, you hypocrites? Now we've already seen earlier in the book of Matthew that Yeshua was able to supernaturally know men's thoughts. I don't believe it's necessary that he always exercised that ability. That could be what happened in this instance, but it may also be that he simply discerned from their words and their approach that they had come with ulterior motives. Just like Jerry would know what I, that I was up to no good if I came to him with the words I said a few minutes ago. This could be a demonstration of his wisdom and how to apply it as much as it was a, a divine perception. But either way, he recognized their evil agenda and their motives, didn't he? And what was his first response? Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? That reveals that he knew he was being to the test publicly, that he had discovered their trap. I don't know if you've ever used traps, but they only work when they're hidden when the intended victim doesn't know it's there. So this trap had already lost its ability to function as the way they wanted it to as Yeshua defused their scheme by exposing their motives and their hypocrisy. If these guys had really wanted to know Yeshua's opinion and his halakha on this matter of the Roman tax, they could have just asked him in a different way and in a different place. That's not what they were doing. If they had honestly revered him as the righteous, truthful teacher that they claimed he was, they probably would have tried a little harder to understand his position before judging it. Any onlookers who saw them and heard this conversation would have known from the get-go that these guys were hypocrites. Because many of the Pharisees, and therefore the Pharisees' disciples also, they were known as opponents of Yeshua. So for them, for them to approach him with this fake flattery would have been a dead giveaway that they were hypocrites who were up to no good. In verse 22 he says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a denarius. 
Did you ever wonder why did Yeshua ask them to show him the money? Why does he have to ask them for a coin? He and his disciples carried money. One of them was the designated treasurer. Why does he want one of their coins? Did you ever think about that? Well, apparently neither Yeshua nor any of his disciples had one of the coins that was used for the Roman tax. That was a particular kind of coin. And that's probably the reason why he wouldn't have had that coin that he needed for this object lesson he's going to teach. Because this scene is apparently taking place within the temple complex. So neither Yeshua nor his disciples would have been carrying into the temple complex any pagan Roman coins that are engraved with the emperor's image and also with blasphemous inscriptions on them. They wouldn't take something like that into the temple. And the fact that the Pharisees' disciples did so adds to their hypocrisy. If they were really pious, they shouldn't have carried coins like that onto the temple mount either. A coin that refers to Caesar as God. Now the coin is identified in verse 19 in the King James Bible as a penny, but the Roman coin was actually called a denarian, or more commonly a denarius. There's a picture of one. It has about the same value as a Greek drachma, which was the standard pay for a day's wages. It was stamped with the image of the Roman Emperor Tiberius Caesar with an inscription of his name in the title. And the inscription says, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus. This would have been the denarius that was in circulation during the life of Yeshua. Now before I go on, it will help us to know that at this time, the accepted halakha was that the Jews were supposed to follow and abide by the laws of the ruling government wherever they lived as much as they could, unless those laws contradicted their religious practice which was based on Torah and their halakha. It reminds me of what Peter and the Apostles said later in the book of Acts when the Jerusalem council and the temple leaders told them to stop teaching in Yeshua's name in Acts 55 verse 29 Peter and the other Apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men folks we need to live by those words We ought to obey God rather than men. If people who consider themselves to be people of God and followers of Yeshua would obey God and His instructions in Scripture rather than church doctrines that contradict the Bible, just imagine the unity that we would see in Yeshua's ecclesia, His assembly. We need to pray that Yahweh will reveal to more and more Christians the truth of His Word and His desires for His people and His expectations of obedience. Living in faithful obedience to God's commandments is how we can really walk in the fullness of our salvation and it's how to really live and minister effectively in the power of the Holy Spirit. Three verses later, Peter says in verse 32, We are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to them that obey Him. If you want more Holy Spirit power in your life, then be more obedient to the Word of Yahweh. Be led by the Spirit and walk in obedience to Yahweh. Be filled with His Spirit and He will empower you to accomplish what He wants you to do. In verse 20, He said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription or inscription? Everybody knew whose 
picture and inscription was on that coin. There's a reason that Yeshua asked this question. The rule of ownership that had been established among the Jewish authorities was that any object that had identifying marks of the owner belonged to that owner no matter where it was found. And if you found something like that, you were obligated to get that item back to its owner and give it back to him. So according to that halakha, a coin with the image of Caesar and an inscription of his name belonged to Caesar. And he could reclaim it as a tax. This was the common understanding at the time. And this is why Yeshua asks the question. Asking whose image and whose inscription is on it was like saying, this belongs to somebody. It's got his, his picture and his name on it. It helps to make his point. Now this isn't uh, an unusual understanding. I mean, we have it in the USA today. Who does minted money belong to? It belongs to the government. Yes, we get to have it. We get to put it in our pocket or in our bank account and we get to buy things with it. But it belongs to the government. The currency does. That's why it's illegal to deface it. And the government has the right to recall it. And there have been times when money was confiscated. I think there's probably going to be some more times when money or gold or silver are going to be confiscated when a new world order is established with new rules for buying and selling. Well everyone knew whose image and inscription was on the coin but for the sake of the discussion they were having it needed to be stated so Yeshua again shows great wisdom and he turns the tables on his trappers who now find themselves trapped in a way that they never anticipated all right they answer his question they say unto him Caesar's then said he unto them render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's well we might ask what is Caesar's and what is God's this word render is the English translation of a Greek word that generally means give back or pay back now since the denarius this coin that was used to pay the Roman tax since it had the image and inscription of Caesar he had every right to ask for it back because it belonged to him according to the common halakha but Yeshua doesn't stop there he goes on to the heart of the issue by adding the words and unto God the things that are God's well what's he referring to well for one thing just as the image of Caesar on the coin marked it as belonging to Caesar the image of Yahweh that is stamped on people who are created in his image marks them as his property and this doesn't just mean believers it means that all souls belong to him he says as much in Ezekiel 18 verse 4 behold all souls are mine people are accountable to both human authorities and to divine authority to Yahweh himself the Pharisees disciples were trying to create a dilemma for Yeshua regarding the question of how to obey human authority but they neglected the weightier matter of how to obey God every person is supposed to give himself or herself back to God because we already all belong to him and Yeshua's brilliant answer shows that normally we are to obey human authorities while remembering that Yahweh is the ultimate final supreme authority so his ways and his laws and his commandments trump men's laws we need to put the emphasis where it belongs on living out 
the Shema. Loving Yahweh with all our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind. Giving our entire self to Him through faithful obedience and service and worship to Him. Yeshua's answer reminds us that the government is not the final authority. Amen. Abraham says in Genesis 14 verse 22 that Yahweh is the possessor of heaven and earth. So since he is the owner of everything, rulers like Caesar only have whatever Yahweh allows them to have. Yahweh is the ultimate authority. He is over every ruler, every human king or every queen. He's over every prince, every prime minister, every president, and every kingdom, nation, and government, including our own president in the United States of America. Yeah. If and when any human ruler, a ruler or government demands from the citizens anything that belongs to God alone, we must obey God not men and not that government. The government has no right to demand for itself that which belongs to God. And no one can serve two masters, especially when they are opposed to each other. So Yeshua didn't just avoid a trap that was set for him. He avoided this either or scenario and he focused on the primary issue the requirement to serve him and his father in all matters he dealt with the dilemma without taking either side neither supporting nor resisting Caesar but teaching us to give God his due his answer agreed with the halakha of the day. While at the same time he limited the power of government under God's authority. And by the way, another way that we can give unto God what is God's is through our tithes and offerings. The principle of tithing began before the Torah was given to Moses at Mount Sinai and is taught throughout the Bible in both the Older and the Newer Testaments. In Matthew chapter 23 verse 23 and in the parallel passage in Luke 11:42, Yeshua makes it very clear that paying tithes is something we ought to do. In Luke 38 Yeshua teaches that as we give it will be given back to us. Now this applies to service and help that we give to others but it also applies to our money. And we're very grateful to you who are supporting this ministry with your tithes and offerings. If you aren't giving to God's work here because you think you can't afford it, consider what Yeshua says here. Do you believe him or not? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 and 7 that we reap or receive what we sow or give and that God loves a cheerful giver. Again, I say thank you to those who are giving here, but if you're not participating in giving, giving offerings to Hallelujah Fellowship, you're probably depriving yourself of some return blessings. I ask you to prayerfully consider doing so. Look at verse 22 of Matthew 22. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. You know, these guys had brought what, what they thought was an inescapable trap for Yeshua and now they realize that they failed and they marveled they, they were amazed but they had nothing else to say so they left his ability to see through their fake flattery and to penetrate to the heart of the matter gave them no opportunity to say anything else about this to him so all they could do was leave but you know what later they had something to say about it. Later, they lied about it. We don't learn about it in Matthew, but in the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 2, it says, They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself 
Is Christ a king? They lied about Yeshua. I hope that we never, ever lie about what Yeshua said, even by accident. Let's always be very careful to get it right whenever we're telling someone anything that he said. And if we're completely sure of the meaning, it's okay to paraphrase it and put it into our own words that mean the same thing. But we must always be sure that we're not twisting his words to make them mean something that he didn't really say or mean. I'll show you an example of how people do that. In Matthew 5 verse 17, Yeshua said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he says here that he came to fulfill the law, the Torah, and the prophets too for that matter. Now some people mistakenly think that he fulfilled the law in the sense of fulfilling a contract, thus ending it and making it a thing of the past. They say, see, he fulfilled it. It's over. It's done with. It's, it's finished. It's no longer in effect. Well, he also came to fulfill the prophets. Have all the prophecies been fulfilled? Mm -mm. Now, his intended meaning is easy to see. If you just keep reading and look at the next two verses, 18 and 19, it says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle. Pause. Those are just little bitty marks that are written in the Hebrew scrolls to assist with uh, pronunciation. One jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Um. I think if you just look around, you can see that heaven and earth are still here. They haven't passed away. So, therefore, nothing has passed from the law. Contrary to popular opinion and popular misunderstanding, Yeshua did not abolish God's laws and commandments. It's helpful to understand that in Bible times, the sages and the rabbis used the same idiom or figure of speech that Yeshua uses in verse 17. If they were listening to a student's teaching of Scripture, and if, if they considered it to be correctly interpreted, they would say that the student had fulfilled the Torah. When Yeshua says that he came to fulfill the law, he meant that he came to correctly interpret it, to make full the meaning. He clearly teaches in this passage that his followers should obey and teach the commandments of God. And in other passages, he said in Matthew 4 verse 4 that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, if you say every word of the mouth of God, can we dismiss the first two-thirds of the book? No. No. And that includes the first five chapters, too, the Torah. That's part of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're supposed to live by those words. He said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. He says in John 14, 21, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He says in John 14, 23, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. By the way, this is New Testament. Uh, John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And he says in Matthew 19, 17, If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Our modern church era that is based on greasy grace that says all you have to do is believe. That's not biblical. 
It's not just about believing something in your head or even in your heart. Yeah, you have to believe, but it's also about doing what he said to do by obeying God's commandments. Sin is disobeying God's commandments. How can you repent of sin without beginning to be obedient? You're either obeying, obeying them, or trying at least, or you're disobeying and sinning. There's no in-between. So to repent from sin is to begin trying your best to obey God's commandments to the best of your understanding and ability. Moses instructed the people of God to not add to or subtract from the Torah. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 he said, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught or take from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God which I command you. According to this foundational principle, anyone who would add to or take away from the word of Moses violates this clear command of God. And this would apply even to Yeshua himself. Therefore, in order to be obedient to Father Yahweh and consistent with his word, Yeshua had to obey this commandment. He could not have changed the word of God by teaching that believers no longer needed to obey God's instructions in the Torah without violating this commandment. And to do so would have been considered false teaching. No one is to try to change or add to or take from God's word and his commandments and Deuteronomy 13 says that anyone doing that is to be considered a false teacher. So, you know what? If Yeshua had done that, there's no way he could be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yet, that is what many Christian churches teach. Without realizing it. They're teaching that Yeshua couldn't have been the Messiah. How ironic and how sad. So let's never make that kind of serious mistake. Let's not ever make the mistake that the Pharisees' disciples made and say that Yeshua said or taught anything that we can't support from Scripture. Let's teach what he taught and let's do our best to live like he lived. That's how we'll be conformed into his image which will mark us for all eternity as his people in his everlasting kingdom.